Um, so next up, if uh, Joel is online, um, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Joel Rose. So he is a charity professional and volunteer, and he's actually served as the chief executive for the Cardiomopathy UK charity uh, for, oh goodness, a, a, a significant number of years. How many, Joel? Seven, ten? I, I lose count. <laughs> You're muted, by the way. Um, so please don't mute. Yeah, um, there you go. So, I mean, ultimately, Joel has dedicated his career to, for, for a number of different charitable causes and has driven the desire to improve the lives of out and outcomes of those that uh, he serves, really. He has, he has huge passion and talent for this and um, and also for rallying people around him to truly to really kind of motivate towards that cause um, and hopefully to ultimately provide improved care, diagnoses and outcomes for patients. Um, and as a result, I also understand that you were uh, recently awarded the World Heart Federation's Heart Hero uh, Award. So, <laughs> so on that merry note, um, thank you very much, Joel, for, for being with us this afternoon and the floor's open to you. Thank you. I'm not sure how to follow that, but <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> um, what I'm going to do, I've actually got my colleague Catherine as well. So um, Catherine's our Head of Research and, um, and Policy, so she's going to be sort of talking through the report. Um, and I, I just thought I'd give a little bit of context first, if that's all right. So um, obviously, as Eleanor said, I run Cardiomopathy UK and we're the national charity for anyone affected by cardiomopathy. So that's people with the condition, but also their loved ones, you know, friends, carers, partners. Um, and as a charity, we provide a range of services, so at helpline, support groups, information, resources, you know, conferences and webinars. And really they're designed to help people feel less scared, more informed, better able to cope with their condition day to day. We also do some awareness work and that's really focused at making sure people know the signs and symptoms of cardiomyopathy and the importance of heart history. Um, and I suppose, you know, the objective of that is to reduce risk of, of sort of sudden cardiac death or, or, or unnecessary um, hospitalisation. Um, and then we have a whole part of the charity, which is is kind of advocacy and, and, and research as well as some healthcare professional education. And that's really about improving access to quality um, treatment. And I suppose all of those things that we do um, relies on us being able to gather evidence both the the sort of the quantitative stuff about people, you know, how many people are impacted and how they move through a system, uh, but also, you know, being able to articulate and really understand the condition. Um, and we use all this evidence. We try and gather this evidence to underpin these sort of advocacy arguments, these policy arguments that we we try and make to local healthcare providers, to government, uh, even to sort of technology appraisals. Um, you know, whoever we we're trying to add, you know, wherever we're trying to advocate, we want to make sure that we've got um, robust data and information to to sort of back it up. Um, and we also want to make sure that we can use that information to underpin our own work so we know that we're putting our resources into the right place. So we've got a bit of a history of doing this, and I think it's fair to say that our, you know, the nature and the way that we've collected that data has kind of evolved over time from, you know, in, in the past, maybe just quick surveys to something a bit more sophisticated. And the 2023 um, State of the State of Care report is the most recent iteration um, of this work. Um, and, you know, just uh, Catherine's going to be able to sort of talk us through that. But I think it's fair to say that, you know, it, it, that report um, has been able to, to serve us greatly in, in providing input to technology appraisals into shaping our own services. Um, but as we sort of progress, we want to be doing more, more of this. And our plans for, for next time is, is, is really to do this with sort of increasing robustness um, and to be able to provide, a, a, I guess, a repository of, of really good qualitative and quantitative data from the patient side of things um, that can be used by other researchers and other healthcare um, policy makers um, to ultimately make sure that we, we're serving our community well. Um, so I'll hand over to Catherine. Catherine, are you, are you online and able to share slides? Hopefully she should be. Oh, Catherine, you raised yes. your hand. Excellent. Yes, Please that, do join that us. was um, <laughs> me shouting that I'm here. Yes. Hello. Um, Fantastic. Over to you. Let me just see if I can share my slides before I introduce myself properly. Go. Right. I hope everybody can see that. Yes, we can. Can you see my slides? We can yeah. indeed. Thank you, Catherine. Wonderful. 
Let me just put it onto slideshow then. Um, so hello, I'm Catherine. I'm Head of Research and Policy at Cardiomyopathy UK. Um, and this is a quick whistle stop tour of the results of our national cardiomyopathy um, uh, survey. It's a patient experience survey. We undertake it every couple of years. Um, so the field work for this survey was actually undertaken um, in the summer of 2022. Um, and because we've been undertaking it for a few years, we did have a bit of comparative data from the previous inter iteration, which is obviously quite interesting, you know, kind of looking at the impacts of COVID um, in some ways. Um, we got three, uh, sorry, 632 responses to the survey, of which um, 566 were people with cardiomyopathy and 66 were partners and carers. Um, so there were a range of questions on people's experiences of living with cardiomyopathy, um, including questions relating to diagnosis, treatment involvement, genetics and screening and mental health and well-being. Um, so um, just to, to talk through those areas in turn on diagnosis, I'm sure much of this will be very familiar to you all. Um, but um, unsurprisingly, di diagnosis is quite hard for people with ca uh, cardiomyopathy. Um, so we found that um, GPs seem to struggle to diagnose cardio cardiomyopathy. Um, over half of people were initially diagnosed or referred for non heart related issues. Um, and only a third were actually asked about family history. Um, whereas uh, people who went to a &E, um actually seem to have a bit of a better time. Um, so 92% of those who first went to a &E diagnosed with heart issue. Um, so um, interestingly, during COVID, as we all know, um, everybody um, uh, sort of waited for longer to go and see their doctor. Um, so potentially were sicker when they did. Um, but also more people went straight to a and &E, I think. So um, skipping down to that COVID factor, um, uh, before the pandemic, it was only 11% who first had contact with um, a and &E, where it was 42% in the last uh, two years prior to 2022. Um, so there was quite a, a change in gear there. So it'll be really interesting to see in the next survey how that has changed again, because um, as we know, you know, getting a GP appointment is um, more than difficult for a lot of people at the moment. So I suspect that number will remain somewhat um, inflated. And then regional variations, the time between um, seeking help and diagnosis varies across the UK. Um, something seems to be going better in Scotland than in Wales. I don't know if we have um, staff from uh, those two areas of the country, uh, countries um, on the call who might be able to tell us what's going better in Scotland than Wales. Um, uh, and so, yes, as a, as a charity, we were in a sort of difficult position in terms of, you know, obviously when people call up, you know, you tell them to go um, to, you know, to their GP to, um, to to speak to the GP about the symptoms if they're not yet diagnosed and they suspect they they need to be referred. But I mean, it would be just as well in a way telling them to go to a &E, given that people seem to have better experience. Although obviously, you know, we do, we, we, we follow all the uh, guidelines in terms of what we do advise our helpline nurses do. Thankfully, I don't have a role in that. Um, so moving on to treatment involvement, um, uh, care planning. Um, I mean, I should I should preface this with saying that I think there's probably not always um, a, a common understanding when we're talking about care planning. And indeed, one of our questions actually um, related to what was in, incorporated within the care plan, and there seemed to be quite a lot of variation. Um, but generally speaking, um, uh, a minority of people said they had a care plan and in fact a lot of people didn't even know whether they had a care plan um, or said that they had no care plan. Um, I don't know whether um, those on the call feel like actually you know most people that they most of their patients do have a care plan um, but I suppose I would put it to you um, that uh, whether if someone has a care plan but doesn't know about it um, because this care plan is not doing their job. Um, and the reason that we're so focused on care planning is that um, generally people with a care plan are more satisfied and conversely people without a care plan are less satisfied. Um, as you can see for the statistics there, the statistic there, there is a significant difference. Um, and so whilst as a charity we're concerned that care plans are not always comprehensive, um, for example, uh, I would say it's particular, particularly of concern that few care plans um, involve information on well-being, given that's such a key concern for people. 
Um, and it's also about the way in which they're undertaken. Um, so there was a question that we have not, we've not actually reported on here, but um, uh, it was 58% of people who felt that their views were taken into account when making decisions about their treatment and care, which obviously means that quite a lot of people un don't feel like that. And given that a care plan is meant to um, be undertaken in a joint way, um, uh, shared decision making, um, at the fore, uh, and it's also meant to identify people's um, uh, hopes for their treatment, and their, um, it's yeah, it's it's, a, it's problematic um, that that this isn't always being applied in practice. Um, so, um, and there's some quotes on the right hand side about some less than good uh, good experiences. Um, so moving on to genetics and screening. Um, correlates most with um, Bethan's uh, talk. Um, we are finding that the use of genetic testing is increasing as you would very much uh, expect um, and I would hope and expect that to carry on increasing um, but uh, people are having difficulty accessing genetic counsellors, there are too few employed, um, not sure that's going to change anytime soon. Um, uh, um, yeah, there's suggested evidence of fewer counsellors on the NHS at the moment. Um, so people are not having their pedigree drawn up um, too often, which is obviously pretty problematic in terms of applying best practice guidelines. And then there are um, variations again in accessing uh, genetic testing uh, in, in different areas um, across the UK. And for different uh, conditions as well, I should say, um, as I think Bethan noted as well. Um, and then on mental health and well-being. So um, too often well-being needs are not being met at present. Um, over 50% of people said that they struggle to cope emotionally over the last six months, which is obviously huge. You know, half of people with cardiomyopathy who responded to this survey are really struggling. Um, and uh, almost as many felt that they could have benefited from some sort of access to counselling or therapy. Um, but they are just not getting that at the moment. Um, and there's a huge need in this area um, across the long term. Um, it, it's common to people with many long term conditions and something that at Cardiomyopathy UK we're beginning to, to work on more actively um, uh, to try and get, make sure this is addressed in future. Um, and that uh, mental well-being is is asked about um, chiefly, uh, but also that you know those referral pathways are in place because at the moment I think too often they're not, and so um, it doesn't get asked about because what's the good in asking if the, the pathways aren't there? Um, so moving on, I uh, don't know how I'm doing for time. Probably I need to to, to draw it to a close. So um, we are planning to do our next survey um, in 2024. Um, and we are, as Joel already mentioned, focusing ever more tightly on the credibility and the robustness of the data. We're really hoping that we can do uh, get, get something into a journal off the back of this survey. Um, we're going to make some changes to the methodology. Um, in particular, the existing methodology has been to survey our own audience, which is fantastic, but um, doesn't necessarily reach those hard, hard to reach um, uh, communities or um, as I would put it more sort of marginalised and underserved communities um, who uh, don't tend to, as they don't tend to engage in, in research they also don't tend to engage as much in health charities um, so we're hoping to that uh, perhaps some people in the call might help us um, across the country with getting information about the survey into clinics um, in the hope that we might diversify um, our, our pool of respondents um, in terms of um, proposed timelines, uh, we're hoping to run the field work in the summer. So we'll be putting out lots of communications uh, about it. So hopefully you'll all hear about it before then. And indeed, maybe some people on this call, I don't know, might want to join an advisory group because we will certainly be looking for some clinicians. Um, and so there'll be a role both in terms of advising us, but also helping us um, on the ground to get um, probably uh, uh, leaflets out rather than paper copies, although it remains to be seen somewhat. We we want to try and avoid hitting ethics processes of going into clinics, but we are keen to definitely engage with ICC clinics across the country to make sure that we're um, widening that net as far as possible to get as wide a variety of respondents as possible. Um, so thank you for listening to me. I'm going to hand back over to Joel, I think, to given he's topping and tailing this presentation. Brilliant. 
Thanks, Catherine. And I think we've got a slide as well. So you, we, the, uh, the report's available on our on our website. Um, I think there's a QR code on the last slide if you can. Ah, just that's that right. On. Thank you. There you go. Um, so I, I, I'm not even sure how that works, but in theory, you can take a photo of it and you can get to the report um, if you want to read want to read the whole thing. Um, like, like Catherine said, I think you know, I, I, our, the way that we collect this information isn't as as sort of robust as, as it as it could be, but I think it still sort of serves a purpose. I think there's lots of good things in there. Um, and we've certainly been able to sort of highlight things like the increase in genetic testing, which I think is 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 phenomenal. I think what the challenge has been for this report is understanding what's COVID and what's not COVID. So how does you know positive trends with which we are seeing um, has that been impacted by COVID or is that was it going that way anyway? And and I think the the next one should give a much sort of clearer picture. Um, and I think some of the, the the changes that we hear anecdotally about um, people's experiences being, you know, we're hearing more positive st stories. Um, I think the next one will sort of pick up more on that um, and hopefully sort of COVID sort of moved its way through the system. Um, but like Catherine said, you know, we're looking for people to help help us shape that and help us deliver it and all being well I think sort of beginning of uh, well end of 24 beginning of 25 we'll be able to um, actually report back um, in a way that can actually be published um, you know peer-reviewed and published and and where the way that the data can be used by anyone um, to, to sort of further their own um, you know in, interests um, for the sake of the community um, so sort of watch this space. And we we doing questions now, and are we? Are we um, is it at the end? Sorry. Yeah. So so thank you both. Um, again, I think that's uh, it's been a great walkthrough, and I think you know that ultimately we are doing what we do for the sake of our patients and their families. So um, if we can hold questions just until the end, Brilliant. we have two exciting cases, and then we'll we'll join for questions at, at ten to five.